I'm Janice Switlow and today it's going to be all about understanding treaties. This uh, reference I'll make primarily to treaties 1 to 11. Reason being there is a uh, gathering coming up July 12 to 14 I believe. It'll be done by Zoom uh, and as well Treaty 11 is commemorating uh, the 100th um, anniversary of it coming into being. So I am speaking about treaties north of the medicine line uh, in what is considered Canada, uh, but be aware treaties 1 to 11 for instance are not treaties entered into by Canada, they're entered into by the Crown. In fact the Crown still retains the prerogative and still retains the ability to enter into treaty. Canada of course is involved in the negotiations etc but cannot actually sign into a treaty. The head of state retains that power, the head of state is the crown, currently uh, the queen and um, it's important to understand that the treaties I'm speaking about are very different from other treaties and it's important when you're looking at the treaties that concern you, that you're a part of, you can't simply throw out generalized terms. We have a problem with this and I'll, I will speak about Treaty 11 for example. If you look at the Decho First Nations website, they will reference Treaty 11 currently on the website, references Treaty 11 as a peace treaty. Treaties 1 to 11 are not peace treaties. Let me give you an example of what you see in a peace treaty. This is from the transcript of the Treaty of Fort Laramie, 1868. First article, first sentence. From this day forward, all war between the parties to this agreement shall forever cease. There were no wars north of the Medicine Line. There was no war in Treaty 11 area. Rather, to say that Treaty 11, for example, is a peace treaty is to also say to the world that you were conquered in war. That is not reality. That is not fact. There are a number of things I will point out about Treaties 1 to 11 that distinguish it from other treaties. Another example is to look to the treaty that um, involves the Maori. And this is the uh, Treaty of Waititangi. Now note that this was actually entered into before, for example, Treaty 6. And you'll see in this first article, and remember there are seen to be two treaties, if you will, one of the English text, one of the Maori text, but the legal reality is that the, the English text is what is the lawful document, if you will. Um, and there are issues in terms of what the deal actually was, but I'll distinguish this um, by saying, looking at the first article, because this is not found in Treaties 1 to 11. The chiefs of the Confederation of the United Tribes of New Zealand and the separate and independent chiefs who have not become members of the Confederation cede to Her Majesty the Queen of England absolutely and without reservation all the rights and powers of sovereignty which the said Confederation or individual chiefs respectfully exercise or possess or may be supposed to exercise or to possess over their respective territories as the sole sovereigns thereof. Now recall that I'm referencing and quoting from these English texts of treaties to point out that if the Crown was intending to obtain a conquering effect, obtain a, um, uh, an end of war through a peace treaty, uh, you wouldn't see this kind of language. But pointing out that even when you consider the Maori um, explanation of what they felt they agreed to, uh, they speak about, oh, well, you know, we retained some internal governance abilities. Um, that's kind of the Harvard model of sovereignty, which co-ops and, and changes the definition of sovereignty for purposes of indigenous nations. To say basically, you know, the kinds of stuff you see in Indian Act you can, you know, quote unquote, that self-government. That's not what I talk about. I talk about the whole bundle. I talk about everything that Creator God gave to you in this place of your lands. And that includes 
you know, economic sovereignty, international economic sovereignty. You did not, for example, in any of these treaties, you will not find commitments or words saying that you limit your trade to only Canada or only entities that the Crown controls. None of that. Um, and what, importantly, do you see in treaties 1 through 11? Critical clauses. Most people ignore this. They see a word, surrender, seed. They think, oh, that means what you can look up in the dictionary and see what it means. We sold somehow. These are not sales. These are not conveyances of land. They're like leases. And if you recall, the old ones, the elders, now ancestors, would speak in that way. Because, you know, back then, they actually could speak with lawyers who understood these old, ancient, long-used uh, boilerplate terminology that you only find in leases. And it's a simple reference. The, re the other treaties I've spoken about, and you can look at treaties, for instance, between monarchs that were settling differences and swapping land. You can look in those treaties. You will not find these words. These words are found in treaties 1 to 11. To have and to hold. Those encompass critical legal concepts. They are what are called the habitum, and that's spelled H-A-B-E-N-D-U-M clause, that references the type of interest, the rights of the lessee and that, or the, and, or the grantee, and, and that, that grantee, the person receiving the permissions, is the crown. And also, and that's, in, you know, to be held, that's the, uh, to, to have, the to be held by, to hold, is the tenedum clause that's spelled T-E-N-E-N-D-U-M. And that sets out who's the Lord, who's the landlord. The indigenous nations are the landlord. It's very clearly there. Now, Canada has not conducted itself that way. It has spread, and this is what I'm speaking about, isn't taught in law school. It's not a, a regular part of any indigenous practice, any Aboriginal law practice. But you will find it in corporate commercial fields of law. Uh, you know, I did a five-year uh, Bachelor of Commerce degree before I did my law degree, and I worked in the field in commerce and business. And leases have these kind of terminology. So what you have established, and this is why when I had heard from uh, the elders in speaking about treaties, and this, and this is directly and also indirectly, for instance, a very old, now passed on um, uh, incredible elder from the Squamish area on the West Coast. He was actually, since a young man, brought to the prairies where he sat with the old elders and they taught him about real treaties. In turn, then he brought that knowledge back to the West Coast, where he eventually, when he was an old man, was able to uh, pr provide that to me to carry, so that I would know and understand what true treaties are. So imagine my surprise when I eventually moved to um, Edmonton in um, uh, 2000, when I started hearing this, oh, this isn't the same Thing we signed or we didn't mean that that's not the spirit and intent and I'm going I'm looking at the documents I'm looking at what the elders say or have said uh, or used to say and it's the same thing but Canada has everyone believing it's not Canada says oh you sold your land or or just fails to correct these assumptions that people make and so for instance I go back to that example of um, the Decho First Nations website saying this is a peace treaty. Well, show me where was the war? <laughs> there was none. There was always commercial engagement. Uh, Hudson's Bay Company trading posts set up. Um, this was business and the Crown decided 
and knew it could never win a war, didn't have the money to engage in war, didn't want to do how things were being done in the States um, after their revolution, and so decided the most prudent way to proceed would be to obtain the permissions from the owners of the land and resources. Now, as I said, Canada has exceeded many times the limits of the partial um, the partial sovereignty that the Crown is able to exercise. The governments of Canada, the provinces, they're limited to what the Crown has and cannot get anything more. But the way this is approached is to one, try to convince you, oh, we didn't actually have a meeting of the minds. You know, we didn't agree to the same things. That's crap. You, there is a clear meeting of the minds. This is permissions only. And here's the most important part. All these industries and such that are coming in, those treaties are personal to the Crown and the benefits can only be exercised by the Crown, by her Crown agencies, by her governments, and specifically cannot be exercised. It's not assignable. It cannot be exercised by third party foreign companies that are not subjects of the Crown they cannot provide any loyalties to the crown. Their whole reason of being, they're often incorporated in other jurisdictions. There is no, um, nothing other than the motive of profit. That's what companies are bound to, earn money for their shareholders uh, and conduct yourselves in a certain way. They have no treaty rights. There's nothing that uh, government of the Northwest Territories, for example, uh, or any of the provinces, regardless of receiving devolution or uh, transfer of resources uh, from the federal government, doesn't change any of that. They all start to act as if they've got more than they have. And here's the problem. Indigenous individuals, nationals, not knowing who they are, not knowing what the treaties really represent, not understanding the limits of the treaties, not understanding the continuing sovereignty, economic sovereignty, governance, the whole bit, get tricked, if you will, relying, unfortunately, on advisors that they trust, who oftentimes look like them, uh, and you end up seeing a whole bunch of signatures on representations in pleadings in courts under Section 35 uh, uh, lawsuits, for example, uh, under various agreements. Everything that I've seen is just loaded up with these statements and representations that are not necessary. I mean, for example, when you have a self-government agreement that clearly says this is not a treaty, this is not a treaty for purposes of Section 35, why then do you have to get these, the, on the Indigenous side, do you have to get them to say we agree that Section 34 under Section 35. There's no need for it. There's all this stuff can be cut out. There are simple agreements that are possible without um, coercing and paper trailing evidence of abandoning. Um, when I see this stuff, and then I see there's quote unquote lawyers on the other side actually endorsing this kind of stuff. It tells me these lawyers don't know who their clients are. They don't understand they're dealing with nations. They don't understand there's much more than Aboriginal law and domestic Aboriginal law is part of that, uh, more than going to court. The skill sets that some of these lawyers have are just not what's needed right now. Um, you look at how countries engage, diplomacy, uh, ability to communicate in writing and orally, consistent with being a nation in a relationship via treaties with the Crown. Uh, in any dealings outside of that relationship with the Crown are unimpaired uh, and are quite frankly not pursued. Uh, or if they are, they're pursued as if, you know, the Indigenous Peoples of Canada, the, uh, the Canadian Indigenous, Indigenous Canadians is the one I'm reading a lot in terms of international coverage of the, uh, uh, of the locating of, of buried children next door to uh, residential schools, things like that. So sadly, while there's an awareness building, 
all of the media is using terminology that's all been oftentimes coming out of the mouths of individual indigenous nationals. They in turn have been taught this is how you speak about things. Uh, there, and this isn't intent, you know, if you go to the intent and you understand what they're trying to say and know what they believe, it's a, it's a real tragedy because they're not, they no longer have the tools to speak as their ancestors did. Why? Because they were put through residential schools. Why? Because they're put through Canadian law schools. Um, why? Because they're indoctrinated to see the only possible way to make things better is to do things the way Canada wants them to do it. Um, I don't see anything getting better. I get really sad recently, not just because of, of all the news, but because of all the documents I've reviewed lately and all the statements and, and all the discussion and it's so off mark in so many ways and that these people, the ancestors, the children that have been buried deserve so much more and first and foremost they deserve everyone understanding what these treaties are they're not sales they are leases that's the best way to refer to them and there's limited things you can do you rent a house you can't tear the house down without the permission of the house owner um, you can't take away a mountain for a mine you can't dig up and contaminate the water which by the way Water's not even included in the treaties. If you look at, uh, and here's another example. Up in, in Yellowknife, there's a new uh, presentation in, in the museum. I forget what it's called. But anyhow, it shows a map of Treaty 11. And in, in that map, it includes Great Slave Lake. But yet, read the text of Treaty 11. It does not include waters. Treaties 1 to 11 all specifically say lands, and in any regular definition of lands, in any legal definition of lands, it does not include waters. And these treaties do not say the lands beneath the waters. There are different ways and mechanisms. Water was not intended to be part of the deals, and they still are not. That's why Canada's busy updating its uh, regulation of water and the territories are upgrading, including uh, Alberta, upgrading their deals of how we're going to manage these land, these waters together. All of that is just documenting, oh, we're administering. So if we're administering, de facto, we must own and have the right to do this. But there's treaties. And as long as people will rely on these treaties and not say and fall victim to a couple of things that are really running uh, a lot right now. One, because of residential schools, a lot of people saying, we don't need treaties, we need a republic, we don't need the queen, let's get rid of the queen. Big mistake. The queen has recognized your sovereignty, has recognized you as owners of the land, and understands that they're beneath, all of those legal structures are beneath. You get rid of the queen, the treaties fall because the new entity is not bound by those treaties. So those people who are um, putting out, I got a video sent to me today by, by a friend um, saying, oh, it should be a republic and things like that. Get rid of the queen. They're not your friends. They're part of a strategy that is underway and has been underway for a couple of decades now, if not more, um, to indeed get Canadians disenamored with uh, the monarchy and replace that. Why? Why was that be necessary? It's a constitutional monarchy, so it's not out of control. The only difference it really makes is that the treaties would fall and Canada would finally be able to complete its attempted uh, colonization and attempted conquering of Indigenous nations. So that, that's the, the main thing there that's going on. Uh, and I know I was going to say two things, and I should make notes when I do this. I'm speaking off the top, if you will. Um, and I can't remember what the second item was that, that I was going to point out to you. It may come in a minute. Um, but, oh, oh, and here it is. <sighs> the, we did not have a meeting of the minds, so there are no real treaties. They're not in place. They're fraudulent. Or we didn't sign them. We were coerced, things like that. 
I need to repeat, the treaties are your strongest evidence and proof. They're proof that you own these lands. They're proof that you gave no permissions over water. They're proof that third parties cannot simply come in here on your lands and expect to do what they want to do. They may well go through an environmental process run by a federal government. They may well go through provincial uh, processes and pay taxes and things like that. But whatever those companies feel they need to do to keep those entities happy, that's between them. First and foremost, they need your permissions to do anything. And I'm not talking about these impact benefit agreements. It really was me back in, in the early 90s where I put forward, look, businesses are going to have to, um, and, and these projects are going to have to include Indigenous people. And surely, yes, they started to form them. But, you know, where were the lawyers on this? Some of these impact benefit agreements are just not enforceable. They're big promises. Oh, we're going to get jobs. You don't get those jobs. They bring in foreign workers that have the experience and it's lawful and they can do that. And there's nothing binding and enforceable in any of these IBAs. There's a little bit of dollars, but nothing near what you should be getting. Everyone should be getting a percentage off the top, off gross, and that should be going into your sovereignty wealth funds. And that's for another time to discuss. Thank you for your time. Please take the time to understand treaties. Remember, the treaties don't define you. The treaties are an exercise of your self-government that already exists on that highest level. So please, don't just abandon that. Don't take others' word for it. Do not just repeat what you hear. Go read it. Listen to what I've described. Understand what the Hebiden and Tenedum clauses really mean and understand the responsibilities as well as a landlord under your laws because it's still your land, your laws still apply. Thank you for your time.